Good afternoon. I am Spot On Weather, meteorologist Matthew Euler, and I am so very excited to announce our summer weather video training series. Um, I mentioned this in social media about 10 days ago, I believe, talked about how this was coming up. Uh, we are going to look into the exciting world of weather all summer long. Um, on this image here, what you're seeing uh, is a couple different areas that we may cover over the summer months. Uh, my plan is to do uh, one video per week over the course of the summer, and I hope you get a lot out of this training and you really enjoy learning and exploring the wonderful world of weather. Now, on this particular slide, I'm showing you a couple different really cool things in, in the world of weather. The image on the left shows what's known as a weather balloon, and if you notice the balloon there, it's a white color, has a string really coming down far from the neck of the balloon. And on the end of that string is a uh, transmitter. It's like a radio transmitter. And a bunch of sensors are also packed into the radio transmitter box there. And this radio transmitter will basically, as the balloon goes up in the atmosphere, is going to give you a vertical profile of the atmosphere. Um, it's going to give you weather elements such as temperature, the wind at different levels in the atmosphere, humidity, barometric pressure. And, you know, I have a little experience doing this um, in my younger days with the U.S. Navy. So it's really cool. Uh, we used to be able to launch these weather balloons. It's really cool to get the data. And it tells us so much about the atmosphere, um, something we call atmospheric soundings or skew T analysis. The image in the middle there, the upper portion of that middle image, shows a cloud to ground lightning strike. And we all know the impacts of really strong storms and what that can mean for us, whether it be power outages, house fires, um, our own personal safety when we're outdoors too. Um, so lightning is a is a, a pretty big killer each year in the United States. Um, that's why you'll hear the National Weather Service talk about uh, when you hear thunder roar, go indoors, because um, you know that lightning is fairly close when you can hear the audible sound of thunder. The image there in the middle on the bottom showing you a satellite image of a hurricane with its rain bands wrapping around the center of the storm. Uh, in the center of these unique storm systems, uh, hurricanes, we have an actual clear area because the air is actually sinking. The air is sinking, and as air sinks, it warms and dries. Um, so very interesting. We have a little rain band, these feeder bands, uh, the eye wall which wraps around the immediate center of the hurricane, around the eye itself. And in that eye wall, that's where the most severe weather occurs, whether it be heavy rain or extremely gusty winds, the strongest winds associated with a hurricane. Um, and, and it's just a really phenomenal type of storm. So I cannot wait to talk to you over the course of the summer in this weather training series about hurricanes. We'll cover that, uh, tropical weather. Uh, the image in the upper right here of the screen shows a person walking down a very snowy road. Um, in this case, this particular type of storm in the winter is known as a blizzard. And there's certain criteria that we'll cover as we get into the video training series throughout the summer. Uh, obviously, huge impacts, tr uh, very treacherous travel. Uh, we do lose uh, people on the roads each winter because of some significant winter snowstorms or ice storms. So we will talk about that over the course of the summer. And then the bottom right shows uh, this has been happening a lot recently in the United States right there along a battleground or a, uh, a major um, change in air masses, a battle between air masses. Uh, recently in the month of May 2019, we've had a lot of tornadoes extending from North Texas into Oklahoma, Kansas, into Iowa, Missouri. Um, you know, we've had really big, uh, big storm systems, uh, a lot of severe thunderstorms with tornadoes. And so tornadoes are very, very interesting phenomenon. Um, we did have a close call here in the Southeast Virginia area in Hampton Roads uh, back um, right around Mother's Day, around May 11th, Saturday, May 11th. I've shared some photos and social media as well as on our Weebly Weather website. So we will talk about tornadoes and their destructive power. So I'm excited. So we're going to get things rolling right away. And I figured the best start for the summer weather video training series would be to talk in general about the atmosphere, right? And remember, I talked to you a little briefly here at the beginning of the video about the weather balloon there on the left and how it rises or ascends in the atmosphere and it's taking measurements of temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, 
all these elements as it rises, and it's so very important. We're going to talk about the different classifications, the different layers of the atmosphere in today's training session. Um, and so let's go ahead and take a look at that and kick things off. Uh, here's a nice image on the title slide just showing you uh, the atmosphere. And, and if I were to equate the atmosphere, I would think of a skin of an apple. It's, it's, it's that thin. But yet it's so very, very important for us um, to live on Earth with the atmosphere that we do have. All right, so let's go right into the training today. I'm excited. We are going to get right into it. We're, um, the plan, again, is to cover a variety of topics over the course of the summer, ranging from the atmosphere, which we're going to talk about today, into vorticity. What is vorticity? It's a spinning motion in the atmosphere. What about thunderstorms? What about severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, blizzards, snowstorms? Uh, we're going to cover all. Air masses, fronts. I'm just really excited to kick this off here at Spot on Weather with this training series. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is the atmosphere, and it's divided into layers. And how do we determine how the layers are classified or the properties of, of these layers? We look at temperature, electromagnetic, and chemical. Now, temperature is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's just a change uh, whether the air is cooling or warming with height. Um, the electromagnetic has to do, when I, when I say the word electromagnetic, I'm actually referring to electrical properties as well as magnetic properties. So if I say something has electromagnetic properties, I'm saying it has both an electrical charge as well as a magnetic um, charge as well. It's involved with magnetics. And then there's chemical compositions too. Uh, if we were to break down the layers of the atmosphere into the homosphere and the heterosphere, all right, um, that tells you the various particulates or gases that compose each layer. But really what we're going to focus in on today is the temperature properties or the temperature classification of the atmospheric layers. So let's start and take a look at a vertical temperature profile. Okay, And I want to point out at the bottom of this slide, you'll see at the bottom on the left there, it says colder temps. And out to the right on the bottom, it says warmer temps. So at any point in time, what we're looking at is a vertical temperature profile, okay? So we're at the surface where we live, and as we go higher and higher up, all the way up to 140 kilometers in this case, on this particular slide. Um, but if any point in time you see a blue line um, and you see it bending to the left, it's bending towards colder temperatures. Or if you see this little green line that kind of just goes up and down vertical, that is known as an isothermal profile or layer, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If you see a red line bending to the right, that is bending towards warmer temperatures. So a blue line bending to the left indicates cooling with height. A straight up and down line indicates no change in temperature. The red line bending to the right is bending towards warmer temperatures. That, that indicates warming temperatures with height, all right? All right, so let's talk about from the surface to 20 kilometers. We're just looking at a temperature profile here. Um, generally within the layer from the surface to 20 kilometers, we generally have a cooling temperature profile with height. So things cool as you go higher and higher above the Earth's surface. Now, once you get between 20 and 40 kilometers, you see that red, or uh, correction, that green, that green line going up and down, very short. That is indicating an isothermal profile. Um, that is one of our transition zones, okay? And when I say the word isothermal, iso literally means equal, and thermal means heat or refers to temperature. So isothermal layer exists between 20 and 40 kilometers where the temperature does not warm and the temperature does not cool. And then above 40 kilometers, so 40 kilometers to about um, 65 kilometers, you actually have the red line bending to the right again, and that indicates warming with height. And, and that is in the stratosphere layer, and we'll talk about that more in depth here in a moment. Uh, but warming with height is primarily caused by these special oxygen molecules known as ozone. Um, and we'll get more into that here uh, a little bit later on. And then uh, above that particular area, you have another isothermal profile where the temperature's not changing. They're not warming, they're not cooling. And then you have uh, just below 80 kilometers uh, up up to you know about 90, 92 kilometers, you have cooling again with height. Um, that's that blue line above 80 kilometers bending to the left. So we have cooling temperature profile with height. Uh, the green line again above that indicates isothermal profile, constant temperatures, no change. 
And then lastly, at the very top of this diagram, you'll notice how the temperatures bend to the right, the red line, the very long red line at the very top of the diagram, above 100 kilometers up to 140 kilometers, you have warming temperatures with height once again. So there's a lot of ups and downs and changes in the temperature. If you were to go up in a hot air balloon and take a thermometer in there with you, up in the balloon, you would notice changes in the thermometer. Initially, as you came up off the ground, you would notice that thermometer getting colder, temperatures getting colder with it. Um, and then you would eventually get into the stratosphere where the temperatures would start increasing um, <clears throat> as you got into the stratosphere. And then in the mesosphere, which is the coldest layer of the atmosphere, you see very cold temperatures as you continue to rise in your, in your hot air balloon. All right. And if you were able to make it all the way up into the thermosphere, that very top layer where that long red line exists in this diagram, you would notice in your thermometer there would be a warming, warming temperatures. Okay. So before we get into the layers really in depth, we need to define a couple terms. The first one we're going to talk about is what's known as a lap trait. Okay. And what is a lap trait? A lap trait is just simply a change in temperature with height. That's all lap trait is change of temperature with height. Now, the air typically in our particular lower layer of the atmosphere cools with height. There are cases, however, where the actual temperature is going to warm with height, and that is known as an inversion. But in general, just think of this lap rate is equal to the change of temperature with height. It, it determines how fast the air cools or how fast the air warms as you go above the surface and get up at height. The U.S. standard lap rate, now this is Standard, when I say standard, I'm talking more of about a measuring stick, the average. So what is a U.S. standard or average lap trait? Right? If we were to do the metric system, it would be 6.5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So as you got away from the surface, every 1,000 meters with height above the surface, the temperature would either, for the most part, is going to cool at 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometers, uh, per one kilometer or a thousand meters or if we were to do it in a Fahrenheit scale it would be a drop or a decrease in temperature of 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet rise you would notice this if you ever gone hiking you may have noticed it or you may notice it if you ever go hiking in the future into a mountainous area the temperature actually gets cooler as you go up the mountain slope and that's why you'll see snow-covered peaks a lot of times with some of the higher mountains. Even in the summertime, uh, you'll see that snow-covered peak because those temperatures are cooling with height. All right, so what normally happens with the, with the lapse rate? When we talk about the standard or average lapse rate. The temperature, like I mentioned, it normally will drop or decrease with height. There are cases when the temperature will actually increase with height uh, where the temperature is warm with height, which is abnormal. And when it's abnormal, it's an inversion, okay? And we'll talk more about that later. But the diagram here on the right, I want to point out a few things. Uh, you have the height on the vertical scale on the left of the diagram, and then you have the temperature in degrees Celsius on the bottom going out horizontally across the bottom, all right? So we're starting out with a temperature on the surface, the bottom horizontal line there. We're starting out with a temperature of 32.5 degrees Celsius, and if we use the standard lap rate, 6.5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters, or 6.5 degree Celsius cooling for every one kilometer we go up in the atmosphere, I will show you what some of the numbers are going to be. So let's take a look. If we went up to one kilometer, for example, and we use the standard lap rate of 6.5 degrees Celsius cooling for every one kilometer or 1,000 meters, our new temperature at one kilometer would be 26 degrees Celsius. If we continue to move up in the atmosphere to two kilometers, our temperature would be 19.5 degrees Celsius. And all I'm doing is subtracting 6.5 degrees Celsius for every kilometer I go up in altitude. That's all I'm doing right now. What about three kilometers? What would the temperature be at three kilometers? It would be 13 degrees Celsius. You would take 19.5 degrees Celsius at two kilometers, subtract 6.5 off that, and you get a 13 degrees Celsius value at three kilometers. Now, if we were to take 6.5 degrees Celsius, subtract that from um, 13 Celsius, what are we gonna have for a new temperature of four kilometers? 6.5 degrees Celsius. And then if we subtract 6.5 Celsius from 6.5 Celsius, 
we get a temperature of zero Celsius at five kilometers. So as you can see in this diagram, temperatures normally will decrease or get colder with height in the atmosphere. Um, you see how we're starting off in this particular example at 32.5 degrees Celsius. By the time we get up to five kilometers, you're at zero degrees Celsius or the freezing point. Freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So on this particular sounding, if this were to actually be a true sounding, we would have a freezing level at about five kilometers or 5,000 meters in the atmosphere on this particular day. All right, so as I mentioned, lapse rate is a change in temperature with height. We have two specific types of lapse rates, however, we need to talk about. The first one we need to talk about is known as a positive lapse rate, all right? And with a positive lapse rate, the temperature is going to decrease or get colder with height. Um, in this particular example, I'm showing you a little bubble of air at five degrees Celsius on the diagram on the right. That little bubble of air, we could call it an air parcel, all right? It's at five degrees Celsius at five kilometers in this case. Now, with colder temperatures up at five, at five kilometers in this case, because you notice where your sounding starts off at the very bottom there on the horizontal line, my temperature starts at about 27.5 degrees Celsius. But up at five kilometers at positive lapse rate, temperatures cool with height all the way down to five degrees Celsius at five kilometers. So colder air aloft, right, at five kilometers in this example, is going to want to sink. Sinking motion, cold air is heavier, it's denser, it wants to come down, okay? While warmer, lighter air wants to rise. So if you look at the surface temperature 27 degrees Celsius, that is much warmer than five degrees Celsius, right? And so that air wants to rise in the vertical. It's lighter, it's less dense. And in this particular positive lapse rate case or sounding, we have colder temperatures above the warmer temperatures. Whenever we have colder over warmer, I'm going to get into that here in a minute, what that means for vertical air motions within the atmosphere. All right, so if we look at a positive lapse rate, all right, we look back at this particular example, the five degrees Celsius, the colder air was at five kilometers, much warmer air, 27 degrees Celsius below that at the surface. When we have this type of situation, we refer to it as cold air over warm air, or we sometimes affectionately call it cow, C-O-W, cow. And there's our friendly cow there on the right, right? When you have colder over warmer air, it's generally an unstable atmosphere. And why? Because cold air wants to sink and warm air wants to rise. So there's a lot of vertical mixing or overturning in the atmosphere because of that. Um, the air masses, the warmer air is below the colder air, and they're not happy where they're located. That warmer air says, wait a minute, I want to rise and get higher because I'm lighter. And that colder air aloft says, wait a minute, I want to sink because I'm heavier and denser. And as a result, you get a lot of mixing of the air masses, and in some cases you get thunderstorm development. It's an unstable situation, cold over warm, also known as a cow. Any of you known somebody who lived on a farm, you know, if you ever, cows are very unstable animals as far as standing, right? You can easily tip a cow, and that's an unstable position for a cow to be in. So that's why we call it cow. Again, positive lapse rate, cold over warm, cooling with height. That is going to result in unstable conditions in the atmosphere. That is going to enhance the vertical air motion in the atmosphere. And that's a lot of times is going to lead to the bottom image there. Look at that big, huge, towering, billowing cloud. That's known as a towering cumulus cloud. And in this particular day, it, it's very tall in height. It's growing very tall in the vertical. This is a situation where we had colder air over warmer air. The sun's radiation heats the Earth's surface, so you get heating at the lower levels of the atmosphere. You have cooling air with a positive lapse rate aloft above that, and you get a cold over warm situation. A lot of times you get these towering clouds and you'll get more active weather typically. If it's summertime, there could be quite a, quite a difference in the temperature from the surface up to like five kilometers. Uh, you could have a very big change in temperature, much hotter at the bottom, much cooler over the top. And in a lot of cases, you get thunderstorms develop as a result in the summertime. 
Now, the opposite of positive lab trait is negative lab trait. So with negative lab trait, we actually have temperatures increasing with height. Notice the blue line on the drawing becomes that orange line, the orange color. But you notice how the line is bending to the right. The line is bending towards the right, towards warmer temperatures. The scale is at the bottom of the diagram, 5 Celsius all the way to 35 degrees Celsius. You'll notice how that line bends to the right. It's bending towards warmer temperatures as it comes up off the surface. Uh, in this case, temperature is increasing. It's getting warmer with height. This negative lapse rate can sometimes happen in the atmosphere uh, where you have warmer, lighter air that it's wanting to rise. Notice that 20 degrees Celsius air bubble there, that air parcel at, at 5 kilometers, 20 degrees Celsius, much warmer than the surface. In this case, you have a warm over cold situation, warmer temperatures above colder temperatures. And remember what I mentioned we talk about atmospheric density. Warmer air bubbles want to rise. So the 20 degrees Celsius, warmer temperature at 20 Celsius at 5 kilometers wants to rise. That 5 degrees Celsius little air bubble is heavier and colder wants to sink. Um, in this case, we have a very stable atmosphere, warmer temperatures over colder temperatures. And in a lot of cases, what this will lead to is a cloud like this, a stratocumulus cloud. Stratocumulus cloud being a very low layer-like cloud. And you see a lot of these, stratocumulus or stratus. Um, when you have a foggy morning, for example, the atmosphere is very stable. There's very little vertical air current motion, very little in the way of uh, the vertical air currents, period. And, and so um, you get a more flat base cloud. Fog is simply a stratus cloud on the Earth's surface, on the ground. So again, just to rehash this, when you have warmer air over a colder air mass, warmer higher up, colder below it, you want the warm air wants to rise, it's happy where it's located, right? The colder air is closer to the surface, it's heavier, denser, wants to sink, it's happy where it's at. So we have a condition in which we get very little vertical mixing, very little overturning in the atmosphere, and it results in stable conditions. Uh, you might get drizzle. You may not get any precipitation at all. You're not really going to get heavy showers with a stable atmosphere because there's just not a lot of vertical air motion. There's not a lot of um, instability stirring things up. There's not a lot of wind mixing things around the atmosphere. And so stable conditions overall, they are going to suppress vertical motions. And in a lot of cases, you just get that dull gray looking cloud. In Southeast Virginia, this happens a lot. Mid-Atlantic in Southeast Virginia happens a lot in the wintertime where we get clouds, a uh, thick, low, dull, overcast, gray, it just seems really gloomy. This is your gloomy weather right here. A stable atmosphere gives you gloomy clouds. Um, you get clouds and poor weather. And sometimes you get the fog, thick fog at the surface. All right, so I want to now go into what's known as an inversion, okay? Um, when temperatures increase with height, we call it a negative lab trait, yes. But a special type of negative lab trait is known as an inversion. An inversion being the opposite of what we would normally expect in the atmosphere. Um, in this case, we have a warmer air layer over a colder air layer. And warm over cold gives you stable conditions. Um, so it's a very stable layer. Now look at the diagram here on the right. The blue line bending to the left as it goes up in the atmosphere, that indicates cooling temperatures with height. And then you'll notice that orange line, how it bends back to the right, basically between about 1.8 and 2.1 kilometers. You see that bending back of that orange line with height? That indicates a warming layer, an inversion with height. And that's a very stable layer. Now, I will mention the importance of inversions in the atmosphere right now. <clears throat> there are some uh, very important <clears throat> implications with inversions especially when it comes to severe thunderstorms. Um, you may have all the severe weather parameters you need for supercell thunderstorms uh, in Oklahoma, Kansas, North Texas. Um, you may have everything in place. You may have really good index values indicating severe thunderstorms are about to explode and blow up. Uh, you possibly could have tornado development. However, if the inversion or that warmer layer with height, if that is stronger or too strong, we call that a cap or a lid on the atmosphere. You could have all this low-level heating at the ground, 
a lot of vertical air motion. That warmer air is less dense. It's rising. It's accelerating. But if it runs into this cap or lid, known as an inversion, and it's not able to punch through that inversion with enough force, that cap remains in place, the inversion remains in place, and you just will not get any severe thunderstorms that day due to the inversion. So this can lead to a, we call it a busted forecast uh, in the plain states when you have this cap or lid or warming temperatures with height known as an inversion. And think about this as an example in your house. Think about when you actually boil a pot of water on the stove. You've got this boiling pot of water, everything's just bubbling. Throw that pan lid right over the top of it. You're capping, you're capping the ability of those water molecules to evaporate from the water surface as they're trying to escape and you're slamming up, you're putting a lid right on the top of that boiling pot of water. It's the same thing in the atmosphere. We talk about fluids. The atmosphere is a fluid, all right? So thunderstorm forecasts may not pan out as predicted based on how strong this inversion is in the plain states. Another example is winter precipitation forecasting. If you get a strong enough inversion um, and warming with height, it could be enough to change snow to rain or maybe even snow to freezing rain, depending on how the vertical sounding is um, from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. But this can also play in a precipitation type uh, that you get in the wintertime. All right, so what have we covered so far in the training today on the atmosphere? All right, we've covered what a positive lapse rate is. You see the blue line, how it bends to the left with height. That means the temperatures are cooling with height. Uh, negative lapse rate means that the temperatures are warming with height. See how the red line is bending to the right towards warmer temperatures. And then you have what's known as the inversion, where temperatures increase with height. It's a special type of lapse rate or a negative lapse rate, special type. And temperatures are increasing with height in a specific layer. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about inversions before we move on. Um, you know, I've lived in Hawaii for a few years. And, you know, one of the most interesting things I was learning at the time you know, I always thought to myself, okay, Hawaii is located in the tropical belt. The tropical belt. It's about 21 degrees north latitude. Plenty of incoming solar radiation, uh, plenty of low-level heating. Why don't they get more thunderstorms uh, in Hawaii? The main reason is the inversion. They have something what's known as a trade wind inversion that happens in Hawaii, and that tends to put a lid or a cap on the rising cumulus clouds. It kind of flattens them out. They look like pancakes. By the time, once, once they hit that top of that lid or that cap, and it kind of spread out horizontally, the tops of the cumulus clouds. But it always mystified me when I first got out to Hawaii and I said, yeah, we're in a tropical location. we got tons of incoming solar radiation. Why are these cumulus clouds not growing taller? And why aren't we getting thunderstorms more often? And that is the reason. There's something known as a trade wind inversion. So inversions can impact thunderstorm development, can impact precipitation types. They do uh, impact quite a bit in the weather world. All right, so now let's move on to a discussion of the seven main layers. What are we going to talk about? Okay, we're going to talk about each of the classifications. What makes each of these layers unique? We're going to start off with the troposphere. Um, anytime you see the, um, the suffix pause, P-A-U-S-E, all we're referring to is a transition zone between the spheres, between the layers. That's all a pause is, whether it's a tropopause, stratopause, mesopause. They're just transition layers. And typically where you have the pause, P-A-U-S-E, that's usually where you have your isothermal uh, temperature profile. Temperatures do not change with height. They remain constant. Um, but the seven layers, if we included the pauses, would be the troposphere, tropopause, stratosphere, stratopause, mesosphere, mesopause, and the thermosphere. And the lines on this diagram represent those temperature profiles in the various layers of the atmosphere, okay? So on this particular image, if you go to the left, if my line as it's going upward bends to the left, that indicates cooling temperatures with height. If the line bends to the right as I'm going up at height, the red line indicates warming temperatures with height. The green line in between the blue and the red lines indicates that isothermal or no temperature change, no warming or cooling, temperatures remaining constant between the layers. Okay, um, So this is the order from the ground up of the different layers of the atmosphere. So troposphere, wow. Tropo literally means turning, turning or mixing. Why do we get a lot of turning and mixing in the troposphere? Because we always get like really strong temperature gradients or changes in temperature. 
whether they be in the vertical on a hot summer day or whether they be in the horizontal with a big storm system in the winter time. You are going to get a lot of mixing in the troposphere. Tropo literally meaning turning. Um, and here's some of the characteristics of the troposphere. Why is it so important to us as we live here on Earth? First of all, the troposphere is a layer closest to the Earth's surface. It's where we live. It's most important. Why? Because it contains almost all the weather. This lightning storm in the upper right-hand image, this gentleman crossing the street in a major snowstorm looked very synonymous to blizzard-like conditions. Uh, that's all in, all this stuff occurs. Hurricanes, everything, all the weather we're familiar with, all occurs within the troposphere. And the troposphere contains 80% of the total atmospheric mass. Um, so a lot of the atmospheric mass is contained within the troposphere, believe it or not, where we live. Right. So this diagram is showing how the troposphere's height in the vertical changes with latitude. All right. So over the equator, the sun is more directly overhead. And when the sun is more directly overhead, there is greater heating of the atmosphere over the equator. So anytime you have a very great heating, a uh, very strong heating at a surface, the air wants to rise. Um, the atmosphere actually gets more expansive. It actually gets taller in the vertical at the equator because the sun's incoming radiation is so strong. Um, so that, the troposphere's height will vary. It's going to vary depending on if you're at the equator or the poles. At the poles, you have much colder air, all right? So at the equator, the tropo, tro troposphere is much thicker. It's much thicker. It's much taller than the equator because of the heating. When the, when the atmosphere is heated, it wants to expand and get taller. At the poles, it's much colder, so the troposphere, the height of the troposphere is much shallower at the poles because that cold, dense air wants to sink, wants to be more compact. And so the average depth of the troposphere is 10 kilometers when we look at the whole globe, um, but it varies with latitude. It's much higher over the equator. It's much lower over the poles. And here's an interesting thought. If the Earth was the size of an apple, the atmospheric layer would be no thicker than the skin of an apple. Um, so again, uh, our atmosphere is so thin, the size of the skin of an apple, but yet it's so very important and protects us in so many ways. All right, so the troposphere, we have a lot of turning. We have a lot of vertical motion. We have a lot of instability, unstable conditions, because typically in the troposphere, the air temperature cools with height. So we get that cold over warm situation where it's very unstable, a lot of vertical motion. Uh, you get strong mixing that occurs within the troposphere, a lot of wind movement. Uh, you also get particles, dust, debris, volcanic ash from eruptions. These remain suspended only a few days in the troposphere. That's mainly because of the strong mixing. That mixing, that vertical temperature gradient between the surface and aloft, it's so great that you get a vertical air current. And in thunderstorms, we call those vertical air currents updrafts. Or on the backside of the uh, thunderstorm circulations, we get that rain-cooled air to spill out of a thunderstorm cloud. That's called a downdraft. So we got a lot of updrafts and downdrafts, a lot of vertical turning, a lot of wind motion in between the atmospheric layers, the different altitudes and heights. Um, and, and plus you get rain. With the troposphere, obviously with precipitation falling from the clouds, rain tends to wash out all that dust and debris and if you're a pollen person, an allergy sufferer, um, you are very thankful for rain because it actually cleans out the atmosphere. Now, particles are forced out due to strong thunderstorms. I just kind of covered that between the updrafts, strongly rising air motion with thunderstorms, and the downdrafts on the backside of thunderstorms. That can actually, along with heavy rain, can actually force the particles out of the atmosphere and, and, and cleans the atmosphere out. Uh, most particles are going to return to the surface via precipitation. And in fact, when we get into the discussion on clouds and how they form, this is a big portion of why clouds form, because you have these particles in the atmosphere. They're called cloud condensation nuclei. Water is attracted to them, and water tends to form around these uh, particles, such as dust and debris in the atmosphere. If the atmosphere was completely 100% pure, and there was no uh, debris or dust or anything, it was just completely clean, uh, we would not have clouds. So it's real interesting. We'll get into that training later on, but I thought I would throw that out there. All right. Now, within the tropospheric layers, we have to talk about 
sub layers that are built within the troposphere. Okay, the first one we're going to talk about is the molecular boundary layer (MBL), and it goes from the surface to about one centimeter. It's not very tall. You got to realize one thing: the air is a very poor conductor of heat. It doesn't do a very good job of transporting heat. Um, so you have this little little vertical slice of the troposphere from surface to one centimeter. It's called a molecular boundary layer. And this layer is heated via conduction. Now, conduction, I can break this down really simple. Conduction is heating by direct contact. So you have the sun's, sun's shortwave solar radiation. Those sun's rays hit the Earth's surface. Um, and again, the air is very poor. Uh, it's very poor, does a very poor job of transporting heat, very poor conductor. Um, it doesn't do a very good job. It's not efficient. Um, so it's so very shallow, the effects. The ground, the surface is heated by the sun during the day, and you get this heating by direct contact from the surface up to about one centimeter. An example, a real day example would be if we go back to that hot pan on the stove. If you were to touch your finger on that very hot pan that was over the stove, uh, you would quickly put move your finger away from that because you'd feel the burn right and what's happening is the molecules on your fingertips are vibrating much more quickly and if they vibrate much more quickly that results in much higher temperatures um, and so conduction would be from the hot pan to your finger the molecules are moving much quicker and you feel a very hot substance and you pull your your nerves on the end of your finger and say whoa I shouldn't be doing this that's hot and you kind of move your hand away at that time so conduction is heating by direct contact. Very shallow layer. It's within the molecular boundary layer. Okay, Going above that MBL or molecular boundary layer is what's known as the planetary boundary layer. Okay, Now, with the planetary boundary layer, it's going to be extending a little, a little further in the vertical. It's going to be a little bit deeper, a little taller. Um, and it's a very important layer in our atmosphere, what we look at. Um, it's from the surface to one kilometer, like I mentioned. Now, the planetary boundary layer is also known as the friction layer. Now, why is friction so important in the atmosphere? Well, I want you to think about wind. As wind's blowing across in the atmosphere, it will eventually run into, for example, objects, tall trees, the houses we live in. Uh, if you go to a, a metropolitan area, a big city where they have really tall buildings, um, the wind cannot blow through these objects. It actually works its way around these objects. And sometimes if you're in a big city in between tall buildings, you will feel a gust of wind. Um, you may even have a hat on or something, and all of a sudden your hat's blown off. And that's caused because friction. Friction acts to slow the wind speed down. So it's a slowing process of the winds. It's very important in the atmosphere because, um, you know, if we have the slower wind speeds by the objects, um, you know, it could, it could get pretty crazy as far as, you know, wind blowing things around much more easily. And above the planetary boundary layer, the friction layer, the last sub layer of the troposphere we need to talk about is the free atmosphere. And with the free atmosphere, there is no friction any longer. So the free atmosphere, we're free of friction. The wind blows unimpeded, naturally, no slowing down of the wind. All right. Now we're going to talk about heat sources for the troposphere. If we look at our main heating source, the sun, the sun is going to send shortwave solar radiation each day in the form of electromagnetic waves. It's going to send that down, that radiation to the Earth's surface, right? And only a very small portion of that sun's radiation actually makes it to the surface, believe it or not. Even though on a hot summer day, you're probably thinking to yourself, uh, it feels like a lot more of that sun's radiation is coming down and making it to the ground. But <clears throat> that is one of the heat sources for the troposphere is the sun's shortwave radiation reaching the Earth's surface. Um, additionally, at night, um, when the Earth is trying to cool off, so after the sun sets, all that heat built up from the day is trying to readily escape, it's trying to rise from the Earth's surface and, and, and head higher up in the atmosphere. Sometimes you'll get a cloud layer at night, and that will act as a blanket, and it will not allow all that sun's radiation from escaping during the night. All that heat that's been built up from the day, it, it'll bounce back down from the clouds to the ground. 
And this is an example of absorption of terrestrial radiation. Terrestrial meaning Earth. Earth's radiating, trying to get rid of the excess heat. It, it accumulated during the day. This cloud layer acts like a blanket, does not allow that radiation to pass through it, and that radiation comes back down to the Earth. And that is why the temperature is usually much warmer on a cloudy night as compared to a clear night. And additionally, this happens with water vapor molecules. If you've got a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, it's a really muggy night. Let's say you're down on the Gulf Coast and your temperatures are like 73 to 74 degrees. It's 10 o'clock at night. It's just so muggy. You walk outside and you're just sweating like you wouldn't believe. That's an example uh, when you have a lot of water vapor or, or higher humidity in the atmosphere. Um, that does not allow the Earth's radiation to escape either. So you have heat sources in that regard in the lower atmosphere, in the troposphere. Uh, additionally, latent heat release is another example of a heat source. Latent literally means, latent literally means hidden. So latent heat is a hidden heat. We can't see it. We can't sense it and we can't see it visibly with our eyes. But latent heat is a hidden heat. And as this is a very important type of heating. Um, this tends to add warmth to the surrounding air. As, as a molecule, a gassy molecule like water vapor, as it, as it changes a phase from a gas to a liquid through the process of what's known as condensation, um, it releases heat to the surrounding air and making the atmosphere more unstable. And this happens a lot. Latent heat release is a very important process in warm type systems, especially like hurricanes, um, when you have a lot of water vapor being evaporated off the ocean surface, the air rises, it cools, it condenses, and as it goes from that vapor to the, uh, that vapor or gas to a liquid, it releases heat to the surrounding air, this latent heat, and um, that will result in even stronger updrafts and taller vertical clouds. So latent heat is a very important process. Uh, it's also very important in mid-latitude weather systems, uh, like in the wintertime, it can also, that process can add heat to the surrounding atmosphere, and, and that could really impact your, your precipitation type. And then lastly, conduction. We already kind of talked about that. Conduction is that heating by direct contact within the molecular boundary layer we mentioned between one uh, surface of one centimeter. So these are all heat sources for the troposphere. Of course, everything starts and stops with the sun itself. All right, now we're going to move up to the tropopause. Um, as I mentioned earlier, anytime you see the suffix pause, P-A-U-S-E, that is simply just referring to a transition layer between the layers. Um, <clears throat> a pause, tropopause pause is located between 10 and 20 kilometers. All right, and, and it represents the top of the troposphere. Now, most of the thunderstorm tops will remain within the troposphere. Most of the thunderstorms, even though they're growing really tall, the clouds get up to 60,000 foot in, uh, in height. Some of the thunderstorm tops, uh, most of the thunderstorms remain confined to the troposphere. There are cases, though, where the updrafts are so strong, like with supercell thunderstorms, where the uh, updrafts can punch through the tropopause into this lower stratosphere. And you're talking about a very strong storm. That's a lot of energy built up, just accelerating in the vertical. Um, so tropopause um, is the top of the troposphere. It's 10 to 20 kilometers above the surface. And that's going to vary with latitude again. So if you're over the equator, the tropopause is going to be much higher. If you're over the middle latitudes, it's going to be lowering. And if you get to the poles, the tropopause is going to be the lowest, okay, because the atmosphere is so much colder and denser at the polar areas. So the tropopause is the transition layer between the troposphere and stratosphere. Uh, in the tropopause, there is no temperature change. As you go up in height, you have that vertical up and down line, so there's no warming or cooling with height. It's isothermal, iso meaning equal, thermal meaning temperature. <clears throat> and there is a sharp decrease in water vapor in the tropopause. That's mainly caused by um, the fact you're getting away from the oceans and rivers and lakes that you have on the surface of the earth. The higher you get with altitude, the further displaced you become away from those water areas. So therefore, it's becoming much drier. There's a sharp drop in the water vapor or humidity up in the tropopause. Now we're going to move on to the stratosphere. Now the stratosphere is generally between 20 and 47 kilometers above the Earth's surface. It's a stable layer. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a stable layer 
because the temperatures, you see the red line there, 220 and 47 kilometers, bends to the right to the warmer temperatures with height. So you have an inversion or a negative lapse rate, which we went over. Um, let's move on to some of the characteristics of the stratosphere, okay? As I mentioned, stratosphere, strato literally means layer-like. Um, generally located between 20 and 47 kilometers above the surface. Uh, there's a marked increase in ozone in the stratosphere. Um, notice the ozone in my diagram here. Um, so what makes ozone so special in the stratosphere? Well, first of all, the ozone concentration, what ozone does, ozone is actually three molecules of oxygen. Normal oxygen that we breathe in every day is O2, two molecules of oxygen. But in this case with ozone, you have three molecules of oxygen. And what this substance does is really cool. The sun is sending a shortwave ultraviolet radiation, very strong. This ultraviolet radiation it's responsible for causing us to get sunburn on, on those sunny days in the summer, especially. <clears throat> but what this does, the shortwave radiation from the sun gets absorbed. Absorption is a heating process. These ozone, O3 molecules, tend to absorb the sun's radiation, the ultraviolet radiation, and that results in a great heating in the stratosphere. So ozone is the main cause of heating in this particular layer of the atmosphere, all right? And ozone is very important. You know, back in the 80s, we talked about ozone holes, especially over Antarctica. Um, we didn't realize we were using chemicals uh, known as chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, that were actually destroying the ozone in the atmosphere up in the stratosphere, that high up. Um, and so we tended to get away from some of that. And uh, the ozone hole has shrunk over time, which is good news, because we need that ozone to protect us from getting skin cancer, and we'd have a lot more cases of skin cancer um, at the Earth's surface if the ultraviolet radiation was able just freely to go all the way down to the Earth's surface where we live. So, very important, ozone. Um, and again, ozone, it's the stratosphere is heated by the absorption of the solar radiation by the ozone molecules. This is a stable layer, why? Because we talked about it earlier, stable is warmer over colder. Troposphere has cooling temperatures with height, the stratosphere has warming temperatures with height, so we have a warm over cold situation. Very little vertical mixing in this layer. Particles are going to remain suspended for years. With very little overturning or mixing in the vertical, there's really no wind, no up and down drafts. So those particles just sit there for years. You get some of the greatest volcanic eruptions in Earth's history. You get some of those particles that just remain in the stratosphere for a long time because there's just really nothing to kind of, there's no rain up there. They'll kind of wash it out and there's no vertical mixing at all. Um, there's a special type of cloud if you live at the high latitudes, um, you know, north of the Arctic Circle, 66 and a half degrees north, or the Antarctic Circle, 66 and a half degrees south. The higher in latitude you get, the greater the odds that you would see this, but within the stratosphere, there's a special type of cloud called nacreous clouds, all right? So I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, so now we're moving, we continue to work our way upward in the atmosphere, and now we're at the stratopause. Again, another pause, a suffix with a pause, and that indicates a transition layer between the stratosphere and the mesosphere in this case, and it's 47 to 55 kilometers above the surface. So not much fanfare with the stratopause. Just realize your temperatures become isothermal again, where they don't change with height. That vertical green line between 47 and 55 kilometers shows that. All right, now we're going into the mesosphere. Now, meso literally means middle. Um, it's an unstable layer because you notice the blue line bending to the left as you go up. That indicates temperatures are cooling with height. So it's an unstable layer because you have cooling air in the mesosphere over the top of warming air in the stratosphere, cold over warm. Um, the mesosphere is the coldest area in the Earth's, out of all the Earth's layers, the atmosphere's layers, the mesosphere is the coldest. And it generally um, resides from 55 to 78 kilometers above the surface. Uh, the temperature drops off drastically with height. It's an unstable layer because the temperatures are cooling with height. And um, you've got warmer air associated with the stratosphere below it. Um, there are no clouds. There is no weather up here in the mesosphere. Uh, there's no heat source either. So even though it's unstable 
and you would say, well, wait a minute, you told me earlier that cold over warm would lead to uh, increased vertical motion, but we have no moisture up there, so dry, there's no clouds at all, with the exception of the noctilucent clouds, which are also very special clouds. But again, you have to be at um, higher latitudes, the uh, Arctic Circle and Antarctic Circle, to really get to see this cool cloud, the noctilucent cloud. I should have thrown in an image just for uh, kicks and giggles. I should have just thrown an image of a noctilucent cloud. I'm, I'll have to remember this for future training. Maybe I'll throw in an image of a, noc a nocreous uh, uh, and a noctilucent cloud so you can kind of see it. They're really colorful clouds. Um, they look really cool. Also, with the mesosphere, keep in mind that only one-tenth of the total atmospheric mass uh, there's not much air up there. So if you were to get in a hot air balloon and go all the way up to the mesos mesosphere, uh, you most likely would need an oxygen mask. And, you know, the higher airlines go when we fly, the airlines, uh, that's why they always talk about oxygen masks. If, if, we lost, um, if we lost the ability to breathe up there, you have oxygen masks because the air is so thin. Molecules are so far apart at this point in the atmosphere. Right. Above the mesosphere, we have what's known as a mesopause. It's another pause. Um, that resides between 78 and 98 kilometers. Temperatures, again, do not change with height. They're isothermal, so no warming or cooling with height. They remain constant. Um, and again, the main thing with the mesopause is the transition layer between the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Right. And then we move up to our final layer, which is like the top of the atmosphere, practically going into outer space. Um, into those areas, a thermosphere. Thermo literally means heat. Um, so it's a heating sphere, it's a hot sphere, it's a hot layer. And it extends from 98 kilometers all the way up to 500 kilometers. Um, uh, very, very uh, widely spaced molecules up at the thermosphere, in the thermosphere. But here's one important thing about the thermosphere. We'll get into it here in a minute. Um, it has, a lot of electri electrically charged particles known as ions. So these electrically charged particles known as ions exist in the thermosphere. And there's the dimensions again, 98 to 500 kilometers above the surface, very high up there. Uh, temperature is going to increase with height. You see the bending of the line to the right on the diagram. Um, so that indicates warming temperatures with height. And what causes the heating in this layer? That's an interesting question. Uh, really, it's the absorption of the uh, molecules by solar radiation, and also it has to do with solar activity. Now, every 11 years, we have what's known as a sunspot cycle. It goes, it works every 11 years, and every 11 years, you're going to see a maximum number of sunspots, these dark, cooler areas on the sun's surface. Um, when you get a lot of sunspots on the sun, uh, you get solar storms forming. Uh, you get solar flares, uh, and, and when those solar flares occur, uh, coronal mass ejections is another example of a solar disturbance. It releases a ton of these electrically charged particles known as ions, and they tend to float. Um, they tend to follow the magnetic fields around the polar areas of the Earth, and that's why you see a lot of uh, the uh, northern lights, aurora borealis, or in the southern hemisphere, aurora australis, because you have all these electrically charged particles that are floating up between 400 and 500 kilometers in the uh, thermosphere. Now these ions also are very important for radio communications. They can disrupt radio communications. And of course, we rely a lot on over the horizon radio communications these days. Um, so this can impact, you know, solar storms can impact uh, satellite communications as well. So. Ions are very important. Right now, in 2019, we happen to be sitting at a lull in the solar activity where we have very low number of sunspots. Um, so, very interesting. We'll get into that more into the space weather. We actually have a space weather training that we'll cover that in. So, what we've covered so far, we've looked at the troposphere. That's our first layer of the atmosphere. That's where the weather occurs. Um, and within that tropospheric layer, we have sublayers. The molecular boundary layer, abbreviated MBL, and that extends from the surface to one centimeter, and that's where we have heating by contact. Um, the sun's radiation hits the Earth's surface and warms the overlying air up to one centimeter. Not very tall in height. Um, next above that molecular boundary layer, we have what's known as the PBL or the planetary boundary layer. This is the friction layer. This is the point in the atmosphere where, as the wind blows, it's being blocked by trees, by buildings. Uh, you know, by mountains, 
can't forget about mountains there. Um, the wind cannot blow through these solid objects. It has to blow around it. And a lot of times you get these eddy effects wrapping themselves around these obstructions, mountains or buildings, especially in big cities. So planetary boundary layer up to one kilometer in height from the surface to one kilometer. Uh, a lot of uh, friction slowing down of the wind speeds. And then above that, within the troposphere, you have the sublayer known as the free atmosphere. And that's basically where there's no friction any longer. All right. Above the, that particular, the troposphere, you have the stratosphere. The stratosphere is a layer of the atmosphere where there's excessive warming with height. And that's mainly due to the absorption of solar radiation by these O3 molecules known as ozone. Very important uh, chemical in the atmosphere for our own well-being on the Earth's surface. Uh, it, pr it prevents the very deadly short, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the ultraviolet radiation is on the short end of that spectrum. Very intense rays of the sun. It prevents those from making it to the Earth's surface. Um, so stratosphere, very warm layer. Then we go up one layer above that to the mesosphere. Meso meaning middle. Um, mesosphere is the coldest layer of the atmosphere. There's just simply no clouds there. There's no moisture to work with, and there's no weather. And then finally, the thermosphere. We talked about the ions, the electrically charged particles that are contained within the thermosphere. Thermosphere is the hottest layer of the atmosphere. Um, you know, those ions have a really significant role in... Um, we talk about more ions being uh, produced with solar flares and solar storms during the maximum number of sunspots, the 11-year cycle uh, with the sun. It releases a lot of those electrically charged particles into the thermosphere. All right, so now we're going to move on to talk about <clears throat> a little bit about pressure because, you know, if, if you were to go, if I had to tell you, go up in the hot air balloon or if you were to hike up a really tall mountain like in the Himalayas, um, you would notice if you had a little pocket barometer or even a smart watch, or anything that gave you barometric pressure. If you ever hike up a tall mountain, or if you would ever go up in a hot air balloon, you would notice one thing, that as you go up higher in altitude, the pressure gets lower. All right? This is an inverse relationship, which means when one, one goes up, the other goes down. Okay? So if we change our altitude, we increase it, you're getting higher above the Earth's surface, whether you're hiking up a mountain, a really tall mountain, where they're going up on a hot air balloon, the pressure is going to drop as you go up in height because there's less mass above you. Okay? Um, decrease altitude if we were come now if we were to come back down the mountain, we're getting closer to sea level. You'll notice as you get closer to sea level and come down the side of the mountain, if you were to have that some kind of instrument to measure pressure, you would notice that the pressure would rise because you're having more mass. The closer you get to the surface. The closer you get to sea level, you have more mass or force per unit area pressure pressing down on you. What is the definition of pressure? I kind of just alluded to it. Uh, pressure is actually equal to force, the amount of force divided by the area. Now, the area is very important, right? Because if I were to uh, put a brick on a very narrow surface, right? If I were to put it, uh, let's say, on the ledge of something, um, it, it's very limited surface area, small. Um, so there's going to be a lot more force on that area compared to if I put that brick on a much larger table, yeah, the pressure wouldn't be as great because it's more spread out. All right, so pressure is equal to the force per area. Here's a couple different instruments that you, we use to measure pressure. The one in the bottom left there is known as aneroid barometer. Aneroid literally means without liquid. You'll see a lot of these aneroid barometers in homes. A lot of people tend to like to put them up on their walls. Okay. So aneroid basically means no liquid. And the image on the right shows a uh, mercury barometer. Now mercury is very dangerous. It's a poisonous gas. Um, but it's still a cool instrument to look at. Uh, if you look at the upper portion on the image on the right, uh, you'll notice a little tube in there if you look close enough. And, and there's a little base of mercury. Uh, there's, there's a base of mercury there at the bottom of the tube. This tube is enclosed, and when the pressure uh, gets higher, more force per unit area presses on the, um, the base where, where the liquid, the mercury is, and it tends to cause the liquid in the tube to go up. So pressure would get higher. Evangelista Tor Torricelli, um, he was one that really created the, developed the instrument known as the barometer that we use today. Evangelista Torricelli, pretty cool. Check it out sometime. 
So how does the pressure change as we go up? Just like we had with temperature, we actually have changes of pressure with height. Typically we see a uh, 10 millibar change in pressure for every 100 meter difference in height above sea level. Okay, uh, One inch of mercury for every 1,000 feet. So if you were to go up in that balloon with a barometer, the hot air balloon with a barometer in your hand, uh, you should see about a one inch of mercury drop um, from the surface to about 1,000 feet. So you may start off with a pressure reading of 30 inches of mercury. Once you got up to 1,000 feet, your barometer should then read about 29 inches of mercury. Once you get up to 2,000 feet, it would be 28 inches of mercury, and so on. 3,000 3, uh, feet, you'd be at 27 inches of mercury. So you're losing one inch of mercury for every 1,000 foot rise in the atmosphere. Uh, that's the typical rate of change of pressure. Now at higher altitudes, so if you're at the top of a mountain peak, you will have a slower rate of pressure change. Why is that? Because as you get higher in the atmosphere, there's less mass above you. So there's not as much mass pushing down on the surface, the higher you get. So therefore, you have a much slower rate of pressure change. All right, so let's just talk a little bit here, just a recap on the troposphere. Um, temperatures are going to change in the troposphere. We already talked about that. Uh, the, uh, the temperatures normally decrease with height as well as the pressure. And occasionally in the troposphere, you have a increase in temperature, a negative lapse rate uh, with height, which is known as an inversion, which is the opposite of what we'd expect. Additionally, within the troposphere, um, your vertical temperature changes exist with cooling with height. Um, <clears throat> here's a quick summary. Uh, if you increase altitude or go up in the atmosphere, you're typically going to have less mass above you the higher you get. Therefore, the barometric pressure will decrease much slower. But keep in mind, the higher you get in the atmosphere, the uh, less uh, mass you have above you. So therefore, you have a drop in pressure as you go higher. Uh, also, uh, as air cools, it expands. And as the air expands and cools, typically you get um, saturation to occur where you get 100% relative humidity and the formation of clouds. Uh, this is going to result in cooler temperatures as air expands. Expansion is a cooling process. So as, as air rises, it expands, it cools, it condenses, it forms clouds, which we are very, very um, used to seeing in the sky every day. Uh, upper vertical motion is going to cool the air, and then we'll get more into adiabatic processes, the cooling and warming uh, in a later, a later training. But just keep in mind that adiabatic literally means there's no, there's no exchange of heat or energy between a bubble of air and its surrounding environment. So all the changes are done via expansion and compression when you're talking about adiabatic. Right? Um, when you come down or decrease altitude there on the right-hand image, uh, the right-hand figure here, or, or facts, if you decrease altitude, you're getting closer to the Earth's ground, to the Earth's surface. You're going to get an increase in pressure because you have more mass above you. Um, <clears throat> this is going to force air to compress. As air compresses, the atmosphere gets more shallow, and that air is going to warm. As the air warms, you get more downward vertical motions. That downward vertical motion is actually going to cause air to warm even further. And uh, that's a process known as adiabatic warming. And that happens a lot, actually. Um, we talked about the Chinook wind and the Lee of the Rocky Mountains, but we'll get into that later. But uh, that does happen in the vicinity of mountain ranges, on the Lee side of mountain ranges. All right, so wrapping up this first, uh, this first uh, training here in the summer video training series, uh, we talked about the layers of the atmosphere. Uh, mainly, meteorologists are going to use temperature classification, temperature changes to determine different layers of the atmosphere. There are specific layers, we talked about those, uh, and you think from the troposphere, the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere. Some key points about the troposphere, again, 80% of all mass is contained within the troposphere. This is where all the weather occurs, where we live. It's an unstable layer, typically because the temperatures are going to have a positive lapse rate or cool with height. Uh, the three particular um, sub-layers of the troposphere are the molecular boundary layer where conduction occurs, the planetary boundary layer where you have friction or the winds being slowed down by buildings and other obstructions, mountains, and then the free atmosphere typically is above 3,000 feet and that's where there's no more friction. So friction, the planetary boundary layer, the average vertical extent of it is um, from the surface to about 3,000 feet is where you get friction, typically. 
Now, if you're in a mountainous area, your planetary boundary layer is going to be much higher. It's going to be much, much higher. Um, you get a lot of strong mixing in this troposphere because you have a lot of air mass changes. And then um, above the troposphere is our first transition layer known as the tropopause. Moving into the stratosphere, this uh, is contains the greatest concentration of those ozone molecules, O3. Uh, this results in uh, a lot of warming in the upper stratosphere. And also very important, again, to protect us from the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, which is not good for our skin. Uh, stratosphere is a very stable layer because the temperatures are warming with height. Uh, and then above that, you have the stratopause. That's the next transition layer where the temperatures remain constant with height in that stratopause area. Moving into the mesosphere, coldest layer of the atmosphere, it's unstable. Uh, because you have colder cooling with height in the mesosphere. So cooling in the mesosphere over warming in the stratosphere, but you really don't have any weather in the mesosphere. You don't have moisture, so therefore you get no weather there. Um, above the mesosphere, you have the mesopause, and that then leads us to the final layer of the atmosphere known as the thermosphere, the heat sphere. Um, very important, there's a, there's a sub-layer within the thermosphere known as the ionosphere, very important for long-range radio communications. Um, again, solar activity has a lot, of, a lot to do with the number of ions or electrically charged particles contained within that thermosphere layer. And it's, it's also proportional to that sun activity, that solar activity. The 11-year sunspot cycles, um, you have a maximum number of sunspots on the sun uh, every 11 years. All right, so that wraps it up um, for the training, the first uh, training on the atmosphere we got so much more to cover. I am so excited. Uh, we are going to cover a lot of great material from the world of weather this summer. Uh, we're going to cover everything from cyclones, from hurricanes, tornadoes. We're going to cover frontal systems. We're going to cover vorticity. Uh, we're going to cover different types of temperature infection, warmer and colder air. And I just can't wait. Jet streams, we're going to talk about that too and the importance of jet streams. So much more to come. In the meantime, Check us out, Spot on Weather, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Monday through Friday, I do put out seven-day forecasts, and I usually share those on Facebook as well as Twitter. So if you haven't subscribed to us, subscribe to us. Um, and, and my main focus on forecasting is Southeast Virginia uh, in the Hampton Roads cities. Uh, but I do mention other mid-Atlantic areas too from time to time. So um, I put forecasts out on Facebook and Twitter. I share interesting weather stuff there. Uh, Instagram, I occasionally throw some pictures or share some videos there. And then the Weebly website is how I'm going to end this training today. With the Weebly website, I'm going to go ahead and cover it now to end the session. Um, if you go to the spot-on-weather.weebly.com, or you can Google Spot on Weather Weebly, and it'll take you right to our link. You click on that link, it's going to take you right to this homepage, this blue screen here. Uh, we have done an amazing amount of changes and updates and enhancements to this website uh, over the last month or so. Um, you're going to get this main home screen. It's going to say, Welcome to Spot on Weather. It's going to say, Subscribe to our official blog for the latest updates. And, and you can go below this and scroll down, and you'll actually be able to put in your information, your email address. You'll get this stuff directly into your box, all the latest weather blogs. Um, so that's something really cool. We really love to see you subscribe to the subscribe to the blog. Uh, going across the top now from the home page, if you were to click on About Us, that's just a quick, brief summary of Spot on Weather. You know, we were founded back in October 2015, private weather company. Uh, we really love to do forecasting. Our primary focus is forecasting, uh, occasional short-range forecasting, especially in the summer months. But then the winter time, we really start focusing in on longer range forecasting with, with the weather models um, and, and, and winter weather systems. So if you go to About Us, you kind of see a little background about Spot on Weather. If you click on the blogs, you'll actually be able to see my latest blogs. I usually try to get a blog out uh, Monday through Friday. I try to get those out each morning, Monday through Friday. I uh, do my best. Um, sometimes the weekends, if the weather's not active, I really don't throw any special blogs out there on the weekend. But I do try to maintain consistency there in the weather blogs. So here's some interesting information about the upcoming weather forecast. Current weather shows the latest. If you click on that, it will show you the latest weather observation for Virginia Beach. Seven-day weather forecast, that's one of the more popular products on our page. 
If you click on seven day weather forecast, you're, you're going to get exactly that for Southeast Virginia, the seven day weather forecast. So definitely want to check that out. Synaptic discussions, um, we are updating those usually Monday through Friday, occasionally the weekends. Uh, but with synaptic discussions, it'll actually give you the discussion from the National Weather Service office in Wakefield, Virginia. Um, and we throw that on and we archive that as well. Um, it's always interesting to look back at those discussions. You learn so much from just reading those synoptic discussions um, that the meteorologists put out. Uh, it, it's really good. Um, and then if you were to go all the way over to the right there and click on more and go to uh, weather photo gallery. Now this, this, is, this is one of my favorite uh, parts of the website. I have thrown in a lot of memorable um, sky uh, the clouds, I've, I've thrown in a lot of uh, past big weather events, uh, images of flooding, pictures of snow, uh, pictures of just some crazy clouds with severe thunderstorms. Uh, I have thrown it all in in this weather photo gallery. You've got to take a look. Beautiful sunsets, beautiful sunrises. Oh, I, I, I really enjoy the weather photo gallery. I hope you enjoy it just as much. And if you check on that, you get all the latest pictures and it's a slideshow, but if you if you would like, you can go into the website and the photo gallery, and you can manually arrow and change pictures. Um, monthly weather archive basically breaks down um, all of the, the past month's weather data, the highs and lows for the specific days, um, if there's any rainfall or any precipitation, the winds. Um, if you go into monthly weather archives, there's also graphical images in there which show you the... Uh, different levels of solar radiation throughout the month, uh, precipitation, again, the wind, uh, as well as barometric pressure changes throughout the course of the month. So check out the monthly weather archive. Uh, under weather links, I've, I've included a lot of cool weather links you can go to, uh, whether you're looking to look at to doing uh, further research or whether you're just um, looking at trying to go to different weather websites for like, for example, National Weather Service Wakefield office, there are links in there. Uh, they, Storm Prediction Center that does severe thunderstorm forecasting out of Norman, Oklahoma. Their link is there. Click on those links. Weather, current weather satellites, weather radar out of the Wakefield, Virginia office. It's right there under weather links. Take a look. There's an extensive amount. I'm always adding. I'm always thinking of adding new links um, to that area. Weather training. Um, what, I'll, what I plan to do is I'm starting to slowly put some weather training PowerPoint slides in there. Um, feel free, you know, you're more than welcome to use these slides if you'd like to provide weather training in any capacity. Um, but I am throwing weather training presentations in there. A lot of cool topics that we cover. And then case studies, that goes back to um, some of the more memorable weather events for Southeast Virginia. Uh, what I did is uh, I went in there, put the date of the event as well as what the event was. Uh, for example, the Circus Blizzard of 1980 in Hampton Roads. Uh, that's just an example, a uh, derecho event of 2011, the snowstorms uh, of January 2018, this major snowstorm. And I've got all kinds of, I try to attach articles in there, whether it be from the local newspaper or from uh, actual case studies from the National Weather Service or the Weather Prediction Center. Um, so you can take a look at some of the bigger events of Southeast Virginia under the case studies uh, link there or the, the tab. And then weather research, I got a lot of interesting stuff in the weather research area. A lot of <clears throat> interesting weather articles from some of the, the, the great, great men and women uh, in the meteorology field. So take a look at that. Uh, I'm going to constantly add to that too. I'm, I'm constantly updating things uh, as far as weather research and weather links, uh, weather training, ways to improve the website. Please provide, feel free on the feedback page to provide us feedback. Uh, as well as we go into the privacy policy and then our contact information is there as well under the more tab at the top. So we are excited. We're happy you're following us. We thank you so much for following us. Um, we really love to share the, the weather with you, uh, whether it's through weather training in the summer video training series, whether it's the wintertime uh, where we do a lot of videos on the YouTube channel. Uh, we really love and enjoy the fact that we can share this passion with you all and we thank you for following us. All right, that wraps things up today. I uh, really hope you enjoyed this presentation, the first of a, a series on weather training topics for the summer of 2019. Uh, again, thank you so much for subscribing. I wish everybody a great day wherever you may be. Take care, and we will be back again shortly to do another weather training video. Take care, everybody.